Hi everyone, namaste, Shakti here. Um, with my Yoni picture in the back here, which is a work in progress. Um, so hi, I just wanted to speak to you today uh, about the Shakti yoga classes I'm currently offering um, where we are focusing on exploring and embodying living, experiencing the Yoga Sutras from a feminine, heart-centered perspective. <clears throat> um, and just want to say a little bit about how I got to be doing this, what we're doing, and why it's so beautiful and amazing. And my intention is to start making a weekly video um, because each week in the Shakti Yoga Deep Dive class on a Friday morning, I teach to one of the Yoga Sutras. And there's just so much beautiful wisdom and insight in there that I share in the class, but I'd love to share it with more people. So um, some of you will know, I did a whole series of readings from the Radiant Sutras a few years ago now, and I read from the Radiant Sutras daily. Well, now my intention is to speak to the Yoga Sutras weekly uh, in tune with my Shakti Yoga class. So today we got to the third sutra in the first book. So we're still very near the beginning. And just for anyone who doesn't know, uh, the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali is a very ancient uh, uh, original text written in Sanskrit uh, at least two and a half thousand years ago. Uh, before that, yoga was an oral tradition transmitted verbally uh, in that beautiful sacred language of Sanskrit and then it began to be written down. And then of course this text was passed on and became the center of teachings for living a yogic life. And there are many translations and interpretations of the Yoga Sutras. If anyone has done a yoga teacher training, you'll know that it's a kind of a key text uh, to study as part of your training to be a yoga teacher. Um, and a very well-known translation is this one by Swami Satchitananda. Um, so that's a little bit about the Yoga Sutras, an ancient text written in Sanskrit, originally orally transmitted, then written down, and now it's kind of become this a guide for living a yogic life and, and explaining what yoga is and how to do it and how to be it. It's divided into four books uh, and the first book, uh, so it's just like a collection of uh, aphorisms or verses. The first book is uh, about union with the divine self, so recognizing that we are the divine, that the divine lives within us. And that's what each of the verses and sutras in the first book is all about. So how did I come to be doing this? And what am I offering? Um, so earlier this year, uh, there, I've been teaching, uh, just kind of a bit of background, I've been teaching embodied awareness through dance, through movement, through tantra, through yoga for the last 17 years. It's been my life. So teaching how to be in the body and bring awareness and consciousness into the body and into everything that we do with the body is my life's work. Uh, for the last 10 years, oh, well, just over 10 years, I had been teaching Kundalini Yoga and Meditation. Uh, you know, that practice really grabbed me and took me and I ran with it so passionately. Uh, and it did a lot for me and I love teaching it. And it really dovetails Kundalini Yoga with the practice of Tantra. It's very, very much. This year, earlier this year, uh, just before lockdown, I think it was, um, it was revealed that the uh, guru who uh, brought Kundalini Yoga to the West, Yogi Bhajan, um, had been abusive uh, throughout his entire teaching career. And um, that... This abuse was not just perpetrated by him, but kind of supported by those in his inner circle. And of course, you know, when you're dealing with somebody who's such a powerful narcissist and abuser, it's very easy to get entangled with the dogma and the power structure of that kind of a system. Um, but yeah, abuse was perpetrated on an ongoing basis, really quite horrifically, actually and um, fraud and other 
crimes. So in a nutshell, the man was not living what he was teaching. Uh, I was really shocked to discover this. Um, call me naive, but I didn't know. Um, obviously, if I'd have known, it would have made a huge difference to my passion for the practice. But what then happened was, as soon as I heard that and discovered what had been going on, um, I dropped the practice. It just made me feel physically sick to chant the mantras and to follow the kriyas that I'd learnt. Uh, and so I was forced to really reevaluate uh, what I was doing. You know, this had been my life, uh, a big part of my life, a big part of my teaching, a big part of my practice. Uh, I see this as a gift, not as a curse in any way. Um, and also just to give context, this is in the wider context of having been in the field of Tantra for even longer and also seeing that um, pretty much every tantric guru um, out there, men, um, had been accused of abuse also and were being exposed for their abuse. Again, some of it really quite horrific and disgusting. Um, so, and then when I found out about uh, what had been happening with Yogi Bhajan, of course I read more articles and discovered more and discovered that actually, again, in pretty much every lineage of yoga, there has been, uh, you know, the same pattern repeating itself of a male in power as the guru being adored, being worshipped, being followed and creating uh, a very unhealthy power dynamic that led to and supported abuse usually of a male guru to a female but not only there are also female teachers out there who have uh, been in the same situation and created the same dynamic so put this in the framework of me personally and what I do professionally and really they're they're completely interrelated and connected they're not separate I teach awakening for women I'm on a journey of awakening myself and I'm constantly seeking to heal, to grow and empower myself. And I, a few years ago, was also myself in uh, a relationship with somebody with what I would call somebody with narcissistic personality dis disorder, uh, the narcissist, and it was abusive. And so I've had first-hand direct experience of it on a one-to-one -one basis. I didn't experience abuse myself in the teaching and practice of kundalini yoga or being in the community no however i did find that it, it's um it's very persuasive when you're in a community and when there is a particular practice uh, out of the sense of spiritual desire and spiritual longing that i had to begin to override certain aspects of my inner knowing in order to fit in with the community or in order to um, do what I thought would advance me spiritually and grow me spiritually even though there was something inside that was telling me I don't understand why I have to do this or this doesn't make sense. And so that's, you know, that's the danger of those kinds of power structures. Um, as a woman who teaches awakening for women, who's been in the field of Tantra and yoga and read, like I'm always reading, I'm always studying, I'm always practicing. Uh, then also other teachers of the awakened feminine, of course, have been part of my learning. I've also interviewed them for my heart to heart. Um, interview series and some really amazing women um, such as Uma Dinsmortuli who's the author of Yoni Shakti and created this wonderful community and field of practice all around yoga for women as a woman um, and uh, uh, another teacher such as Kachi Ananda who I interviewed and met in Bali Spirit Festival who also teaches yoga dharma from a feminist perspective, really fiery and um, completely radically seeking to reframe a very patriarchal, a long-standing patriarchal framework for the uh, teaching of yoga 
both um, philosophically as well as physically. Um, because this, this patriarchal, um, long-standing patriarchal approach um, is completely, it completely permeates the world of teaching, of yoga, of tantra, um, both intellectually, philosophically and physically. So just for example, in terms of seeking to transcend rather than to integrate, seeking to control and discipline the mind and the body as opposed to love and integrate, you know. And so when I heard about the, uh, the horrific abuse that had been happening um, in, in the world of Kundalini Yoga that the founder guru had perpetrated, you know, and having recognized this in Tantra and Yoga uh, more and more in the sphere around me, you know, it really was a time for a clean break and for me to sit back with myself, with my truth, with my understanding, with my experience, with my wisdom, I mean, you know, which I've been overlooking and con constantly um, putting myself less than bowing down to someone who was telling me to do something even though my gut instinct didn't feel right and I recognized this is the same dynamic I felt in my abusive relationship you know where he would constantly undermine me and question me and make me second guess myself but hey um, I've been teaching embodied awareness and studying spirituality for 17 years I'm a really smart woman with a huge heart I have a lot of wisdom and um, a lot of beautiful teachings to bring through. And actually, I hadn't really been fully recognizing that and honoring that and seeing the worth in that, in myself and in what moves through me. Because of course, as a priestess of the goddess, um, someone who's been working with the divine feminine for many years, when I'm fully tuned in and in my power and in my zone of genius, you could call it, or tapped into source, you could call it, there is a divine wisdom that flows through me as words, as movement, um, as intuitive knowing, intuitive seeing. All of us have the potential to tap into that. All of us do, so it's not that I'm saying I'm special and I'm more special than you, but I do recognize that is something that happens in me and through me and for me, and that is part of my purpose in this world, is to stand as the embodiment of the Divine Feminine and really tap into that energy and then move in my life and speak from that. Of course, it's not continuous, it's always um, you know, an ongoing thing, but that wisdom is there and I recognize that um, that intuitive ability to tap in, to know, to feel, to feel the energy of a group of people, for example, to intuitively know what to teach in that moment uh, for this group. I have that ability and we all have that ability, but I've been honing it for 17 years. So there needs to be this rebalancing of the body and the mind, of the intellect and the intuition, of the heart and the sex with spirit. And that's what my work and my life is all about. So when I teach a class, I tune in to the field. I tune in and I speak and I engage and we share. And then when I'm teaching, now my own practice, Shakti Yoga, which was birthed out of this letting go of everything I'd known and then waiting to see what came through, I'm able to draw on all the wisdom and all the many trainings I've taken in various embodiment practices, you know, which is a lot. Um, the Nia technique, body work, and um, energy healing, different levels of Kundalini Yoga teacher training and so on and so forth, tantric trainings, all of that, and drop into the stillness of the present moment and open to receive divine guidance in the moment as to what to teach, what to say, what to offer. So it's not routinized, it's not mechanized, it's not a pre-given structure from somebody outside of me. Everything that I teach comes from within my body, from within my being, from within my heart, from within my soul, and from my connection to source in the moment. I hope that makes sense. And so this is what I now offer Shakti Yoga and as part of my own process of like 
re-inquiring, so what is yoga then? What is it? If it is not this, what is it? How do I teach going forward? So part of it is what I've already explained in terms of my discovery of, well, uh, not discovery, but, but really deeper honoring of what I already know and am and can be. And then another part of me was like, let me go back to the original sources and begin to inquire into those original sources for myself and trust that I am a powerful teacher and interpreter myself and I don't need a middle person to mediate this truth for me. Uh, and so I went back to the Yoga Sutras and with all honesty, when I first picked up this book, um, this is a new one, but when I first picked up another version before, uh, it left me cold. I found it very uh, left brain, very rational, very masculine, very patriarchal, and also, quite honestly, a really bad translation. Um, I'm a linguist, so I've studied many languages. I am fluent in German, I speak some French, some Italian, I've studied Russian, I've studied Burmese, and I also studied some Mandarin. So I'm a linguist, and I understand what it is to translate from one language to another language and to speak a different language, and it's not just a case of getting a dictionary, looking a word up, and then using that word from the dictionary. You have to have a feeling for the language, for the culture. You have to have been immersed in the culture and know the idioms to be able to translate something. So a literal translation will not do it. You have to kind of get a feeling, a full, you have to immerse yourself, embody the culture. Even I notice as I'm speaking, I'm beginning to use my hands more, right? So um, it comes, language comes in and through the body. It's not just up here. Um, of course, we all learn different ways, and I've learned my languages by uh, um, being really good at hearing and repeating. Other people are much more intellectual and linear with their languages. Um, but anyway, so just to say that Sanskrit is a language that has then been translated, and of course, we could argue to the cows come home about the true meaning of what was written down. Um, of course, we're never going to know, uh, you know, because truth is transmitted, and of course, seeing that the translations of the sutras were done by men, for men, right? So there's already that historical context which will influence what we see in what's written down. And of course, what's missed out a lot of the time, um, because a very masculine approach will see and want to translate more literally, perhaps, um, and remember, when I say masculine, it's not the same as man, and when I say feminine, it's not the same as woman. Um, but a very masculine approach will be very logical and linear, and translate perhaps word for word, without taking into account the feeling, uh, the emotion, the resonance and the frequency also. Um, so, for example, the Radiant Sutras that I read from, which is a translation by Lauren Roche, a man, so just to say it doesn't have to be man, woman, separate, I'm not sort of separating here, he translated the very ancient tantric text, the Vijnana Bhairava Tantra, and his translation I find absolutely exquisite. It resonates with me, and the Sanskrit is a language of Shakti transmission, so it carries, Sanskrit language carries an awakening impulse of energy in it. If you read it, if you listen to it, if you hear it, it will begin to vibrate in your body to wake you up spiritually, right? And so when that's translated, you can't just take it literally, logically, you have to bring that feeling and that energy, the feminine, into the translation. And I feel that Lauren Roche's translation of the Vijnana Bhairava Tantra does that exquisitely. Uh, I picked up a far more academic translation by an Indian guru uh, that was seen to be like the translation and it just left me cold because it was just so up in the head um, and dry. I couldn't relate to it in the slightest. You know, and I went on to some blogs and saw that scholars were arguing about you know, who's done the right translation, and Lauren Roche isn't a Sanskrit scholar, so how could he translate it? But you know what? The most important thing for me is, do I feel it? Do I feel it? Yes or no? If I don't, what's the point? You know, Tantra and yoga are in practices of embodiment, and they're practices of 
bringing spirit into the flesh and unifying spirit and matter, unifying masculine and feminine. But unfortunately, a lot of these scholars aren't living and breathing that. They may be incredibly brainy and they may have studied Sanskrit for, it for years. They may be able to meditate in stillness beautifully for hours, days, months at a time. But what is missing from that is the embodied presence of the feminine. Um, the feelings, the emotions, the sexuality, the sensuality, the connectivity, the relatedness, it's all missing. And there's a danger in that imbalance that we simply spiritually bypass. And there's a danger, which is what has happened, that the teacher, the male guru, sits at the head of the class and speaks to everyone and everyone's like bowing down as if that's the ultimate truth. But the teacher is not embodying the words he's speaking, right? And that's where you get the shadow coming in. Uh, because you can intellectually understand a whole lot of wisdom. You can intellectually relay it, but you may not be embodying it. And that's the catch. So for me, my practice as a human being, as a teacher, as a woman, is to keep on embodying and unifying and integrating, right? And not pretending that I am higher than you and that I am the ultimate authority. I am not. And anyone who makes that claim in this day and age, I would be suspicious because I have yet to meet a person without a shadow. Um, I've yet to meet a person who's fully integrated. We all have a shadow. And I'd be suspicious of someone who denies it. <laughs> so I'd rather just be open about mine, <laughs> which I think I am. Um, then pretend I don't have one. So these sutras, luckily um, I found in my searching, you know, how do I go forward? How do I go forward? What do I do? How do I embrace this? How do I make sense of this for me in a way that resonates fully in my body, that feels good to me as a woman who's sassy, who's sexy, who's loving, who's dynamic. How do I make sense of this? What is yoga to me? And I found this beautiful book, um, which is called The Secret Power of Yoga, A Woman's Guide to the Heart and Spirit of the Yoga Sutras by Nishala Joy Devi. So this is my new textbook. And what I do is I read both of these in parallel. And most importantly, I do my practice. And I take the words. So um, something to know about embracing these sutras and the study of them, just as with the Radiant Sutras, there's three stages. So the first stage is to listen and to repeat and to speak. So the sound and the frequency of the Sanskrit, right? And you just listen and repeat, listen and repeat, listen and repeat, hear it, hear it, feel it, feel it. So even that is an embodied experience. You can't listen without feeling. If you are, your body and mind is split off and you need to do some integration work. That's what yoga is about. Come to my class. <laughs> listen. Secondly, um, reflect. Take the sutra and reflect on it. Meditate on it. Let it be with you. What I do is I take one sutra a week. I repeat it. I chant it. I walk with it. I let it just sort of simmer through my whole being and percolate through and wait for insights to rise up as they do. Third, experience. You have to experience it, which means embody it. Not just speak it, experience it. So when I talk, for example, today's sutra that I was teaching to was united uh, in the heart. Consciousness is steadied. Oh, my battery's getting low. United in the heart, consciousness is steadied. And then we experience our true nature, joy. Well, I can speak those words to you, uh, but if I don't experience that, or if I haven't experienced that, you know, there's a bit missing. And so it is with all the rest of it. So three levels of working with these sutras, and we started at the beginning, and then we're working our way through. So I take a sutra each week, 
I recite it, I repeat it, I chant it, I meditate on it, I reflect with it, and I practice every day. And I explore, how do I bring this experience into my body? How could I teach this through the body? How do I feel this in my body? What, what postures support this? What music supports this? I also create a playlist each week for the class um, because it brings me such joy. I love music. Um, and having the right music to support really helps me enjoy and support the practice. So that's my process. And then every Friday I deliver the class and each Friday then I'll share what I've learned or what I've understood about the particular sutra for about 10 or 15 minutes. And then we go into the embodied practice, the experiencing of it. And it's really beautiful because then we really do deepen our understanding. Um, so just to kind of summarize, so far we've done the first three sutras. Um, and then let's see if I can remember them without looking, um, without cheating. Okay, so the first one is Atha Yoga Nushasanam. With, a, with humility, an open heart and mind, we embrace the sacred study of yoga. The second one, Yoga Chitta Vritti Narodaha. Mine's gone blank. I've got to look it up now. Oh, my mind's gone completely blank. Sorry, I was doing so well. Um, so first one, with humility and open heart and mind, we embrace the sacred study of yoga. Oh, second one. Yoga chitta vritti nirodaha. Yoga is the uniting of consciousness in the heart. Third one, the one that we did today. Tada drashtu svarupe vastanam. United in the heart, Consciousness is steadied. Then we abide in our true nature, joy. And connected to that, because these four are all kind of interrelated, um, I'm just going to read the Sanskrit, which I don't yet know the fourth one, but I know the first three. Vritti sarupam itaratra. Okay, vritti sarupam, sa, vritti sarupyam itaratra. That's the fourth one. And the translation. At other times we identify with the rays of consciousness which fluctuate and encourage our perceived suffering. So there you have it. These first four verses they set out what yoga is. It's about unification, it's about uniting consciousness in the heart, uh, it's about um, noticing when we get out of balance and well, there are there's these fluctuations in the mind the body and the motions which take us out of center which temporarily create our forgetting and our entrapment in the illusion of Maya as it were and then it's like yoga brings us back to the uniting to the remembrance of our divinity of our oneness with source so um, and the feminine principle and the feminine approach that I'm taking through my own study and inspiration from Nishala Joy Devi is the embrace of all rather than the very masculine approach which if you take the masculine translations by Swami Satchitananda he will talk not about the heart he will talk about control he will talk about discipline he will talk about control and restrain the mind and so it's a very different approach for me that's that's you know speaks volumes it's the patriarchal thing to want to control the feminine because of course the body the emotions the mind sexuality they are all expressions of the feminine principle and the patriarchy wants to control restrain modify and correct that does not feel good to me what feels wonderful to me is to embrace all that i am masculine and feminine as one and bring that unification in and when I do that, then yes, I do feel that in my heart. I do feel that in my whole body. So there's a stillness in the mind, for sure. But that stillness is actually permeating my entire being. And when that stillness of pure consciousness permeates my entire being, it is blissful. I experience bliss. And that is the joy um, that is spoken about in the fourth sutra. So I hope that's been interesting for me to share that. Uh, and from now on, I'll be sharing weekly as I go through these sutras. And if you want to join the class itself, 
Uh, it's every Friday morning live on Zoom, 9 to 10, 30 a.m. So it's an hour and a half. We do a little check-in, um, you know, a little very quick check-in to see how everyone is. That's really important. About 10 to 15 minutes, 10 minutes of me talking about the sutra and its meaning and how we can interpret it in our real day live. So, you know, it's really relevant to living every day, which is cool because it's supportive. Everyone's going through a tough time right now. These sutras help us. And then we go into the practice. There's a playlist to support you on Spotify that you can access and relaxation, meditation at the end. So it's a beautiful, I record the class so you can access it for seven days. That's included in your registration. Um, and it's only 10 pounds, wow, isn't that amazing, yay. Uh, and um, for the rest of this month, September, which isn't that much longer, is it? Um, if you register, you can invite a friend to come and join because of course I'm still spreading the word about this practice. Nobody really knows about it yet. Um, so that's one way that I'm offering more people to come and try and experience because you can't really know what it is until you experience it and see what it is for you. So welcome, welcome. Uh, if you have any questions, post them below and I will also put the link uh, to my webpage, the Shakti Yoga page on my website, shaktisandari.com, so you can read about it and register if you feel to. And that's it. So um, yeah, much love. Enjoy this beautiful weekend. We're going to have loads of sun. Yay. <laughs> Lots of love.